Good morning to all of you. And uh, I've been asked to sort of lay out for all of you this morning in whatever it is, 19 minutes now, I guess, uh, my idea of India. And it, in some ways, it's very simple because it really emerges uh, from some ideas that have been around for an awfully long time. There's an idea of India that's in a civilizational sense that goes back to the Vedic references to Bharatvarsh as a land between the Himalayas and the sea. Um, and that's an ancient idea. It, it's an idea of nationhood, which, uh, for example, the Harvard professor Diana Eck described as uh, a, a sort of sacred land knit together by countless tracts of pilgrimage. And if that seems a terribly Hindu idea, well, it's also shared outside because uh, Maulana Azad wrote about how Indians going on the Hajj, whether they were uh, Pakhtuns from the Northwest or Tamils from the South, were all universally called by the Arabs uh, on the Arab Peninsula as Hindi because they seem to be coming from a distinctive civilization and a distinctive civilizational space called Hind. There's also, of course, the more modern idea of India since 1947, um, the boundaries of our nationhood. And that idea, again, is um, a somewhat complicated one because in some ways, if you look at our, our astonishing variety and diversity, it's almost as if the European Union suddenly dissolved all their individual sovereignties and came together as one country with one capital, one constitution, one political system. That's the kind of diversity we incorporate within that idea of India. But I essentially come down very simply to the idea that established the present contours of our country on the 15th of August, 1947. Because as you know, our country was born, our birth was also an abortion. It was a birth that witnessed the savage partition of the land. And at that time, it was an era where within the next five years, there were other partitions. You had East and West Germany, you had North and South Korea, North and South Vietnam. But unlike all of those, ours wasn't geographical. It wasn't all North Indians going one way and South Indians going another. Ours uh, had nothing to do with ideology. It wasn't all the communists or Marxists going into one country and, and the capitalists uh, going into another. Ours was based on a totally different dispute. It was about one simple question, whether religion should be the basic determinant of nationhood. And those who said that their religion determined their national identity, they went off and created Pakistan. And those who remained said, no, our struggle for freedom was a struggle for everyone, and we are determined to create a country for everyone. And they spent the next three years writing a constitution, two and a two years and a bit, writing a constitution that incorporated that fundamental idea. That fundamental principle was the idea of India. The idea essentially that it didn't actually matter what your caste was, your religion was, your language was, which part of the country you were born in, the color of your skin. If you were a citizen of India, you would have the same rights as everyone else. And none of those factors mattered at all. That was the essential idea of India. And in those situations, uh, you found a number of challenges, undoubtedly, because of this vast variety we've talked about. Pakistan had just been created as a country for India's Muslims, and the question was asked whether Muslims in India should have a different sort of place. In fact, in the Constituent Assembly, somebody stood up and said, well, now that the Muslims have got their own state, shouldn't we declare India as a Hindu state? And it was overwhelmingly rejected by the Constituent Assembly because the far-seeing leaders of our country came down firmly on the idea that everyone was Indian, everyone who laid claim to our citizenship by virtue of birth and upbringing and belonging, they had the same rights as everyone else. And one really needed to just look at two examples of how this played out. I would just go to 1971. I was in high school at the time. But it's come back over and over again as I look back on, on that war when the Pakistani generals were foolish enough to proclaim a jihad against the Hindu unbeliever. And they confronted a military headed on the Indian side by a general who's Parsi, General Manikshaw, 
with an air force in the northern sector commanded by a Muslim air marshal, later air chief marshal Latif. In the east, where the war was fought in what was then East Pakistan, the general officer commanding the Eastern Command was a Sikh, General Jasjit Singh Arora, and the general we helicoptered into Dhaka to negotiate the terms of surrender of the Pakistanis was Jewish, Major General J.F.R. Jacob. That was India in 1971. And I've been to that tiny island in Diu where there is a memorial to the only ship we lost in the 71 war, INS Kukri, that sank with all hands on board. Captain Mullah, in command of the ship, went down with the others. And you read the names of every sailor and jawan who perished on INS Kukri in this memorial in Diu. And you will see every community in India represented there. You will see every religion, every region of the country. No one has a monopoly on the idea of India. Everyone has shed their blood, sacrificed their lives to preserve and protect our India. And it's from there that my idea emerges. It's clearly not the classic idea of nationalism, which came to the world from Europe, where nations were organized around a contiguity of language, ethnicity, and geography, because none of those criteria really apply in India. I mean, our perfect geography of Bharatvarsh, the Himalayas, and the sea was hacked by the partition of 1947. Languages, well, we have, what is it, 23 currently recognized in the Constitution, in addition to English. We have <coughs> 35 spoken by more than a million people each, if you ask the ethno-linguists, and I think we have about 22,000 dialects, some of which are spoken by more people than speak Norwegian or Danish. So where does language give us a national identity? And as for ethnicity, our ethnicities are also diverse. And strictly speaking, um, there are Indians who have ethnically more in common with so-called foreigners than they have with each other. So uh, an Indian Punjabi or Bengali is ethnically more kin to a Pakistani or a Bangladeshi than he is to a Poonawala or a Bangalorean. So ultimately, none of these classic features uh, gives us our nationhood, and surely not religion either, since we are home to every religion known to man, with the possible exception of Shintoism, and every, every kind of way of reaching out one's hands to God is prevalent in India. So what it is instead is indeed the nationalism of this idea. The idea, if I can sort of turn Peter Pan around on his head, of an ever, ever land. A land that is emerging from this ancient civilization, that is united in a common geography, what remains to us after 47, and that is above all sustained by pluralist democracy. Ours is what I've called in my book, The Battle of Belonging, a civic nationalism. That is a nationalism anchored not in timeless verities that come to you from birth of your identity, your religious identity, your caste, and so on, it's a nationalism anchored in a constitution and in institutions. That is where the idea of India is sustained. And that's a very, very interesting idea because when you think about the institutions that sustain our democracy, you find that we are able through our democracy to overcome these differences of caste, of creed, of color, of culture, of consonant, of conviction, of custom and costume, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is around the simple democratic idea that in a large, diverse democracy like ours, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. It seems to me that the reason we were able to preserve our consensus through all these seven and a half decades was that simple idea of India. And with that, therefore, it's a democracy that is sustained by autonomous institutions, it's a democracy that holds up pluralism as its ideal, that sees in our diversity not a sign of weakness, but a sign of our strength and accommodativeness, a democracy based on inclusion. And when you look at the kind of changes that have taken place in the last 75 years through this democracy, 
One can only marvel. I mean, look at the social changes for 3,000 years. Could anyone in Aryavrat have imagined a Dalit woman ruling over the Indo-Gangetic plain? And yet we've seen Mayabati be three times elected as chief minister of Uttar Pradesh. In economics, we came to power with the economics of nationalism, where we felt that since the East India Company had come to trade but stayed on to rule, we had to be suspicious of every foreigner with a briefcase. And we cut India off from the global capitalist system, the global economy, and, and tried to grow through protectionism, giving us what the minister reminded us was called the Hindu rate of growth. But then we changed, and that transformation, starting in 1991, with Manmohan Singh's famous line that <clears throat> no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come, well, the time came for that change, and that change brought us to uh, the kind of revolutionary economic changes we've witnessed for the last generation, the last 30 years. And then, apart from that social and economic change, we have had the political change of a country founded on secularism, inclusion, and diversity, finding itself suddenly ruled by a party that professes Hindutva and has the avowed aim of converting India into a Hindu Rashtra. So given all of that, in any other country, these kind of dramatic transformations might have resulted in a revolution. But the reason we've done these transformations without revolution and have been evolving towards interesting manifestations of all of these, all contested, all debated, but all happening through the ballot box, is because of the democratic consensus I described to you. And that's why it is so absolutely vital for us. When we speak about the question that Mrs. Irani answered through uh, economic points, which I don't think any of us would disagree with any of the economic points she raised, it still avoids the central question of the toxin of hatred for minorities in general and one minority in particular that has been injected into our national discourse. The government may not have officially done it, but it's condoned all those who in the name of the ruling forces of our country have othered a significant portion of our population. And that exclusion is actually in many ways profoundly anti-Hindu. <coughs> the minister quoted Swami Vivekananda. Well, I've been a Vivekanand Bhakt since my college days. And having read everything he said, all his addresses and speeches, I can tell you that his idea of Hinduism was very different from that of the advocates of Hindutva. Because he said that he was proud to speak of a religion that gave the world not just tolerance but acceptance. Something I read as a child and stayed with me ever since. Because when you think about it, <coughs> we're all taught in school that tolerance is a virtue, a tolerant king's a good guy. But when you really think about it, tolerance is a very patronizing idea. The tolerant king is really saying, look, I have the truth, you are in error, but I will magnanimously indulge you in your right to be wrong. That's not good enough. But what Swami Vivekananda said is Hinduism is not just that. Hinduism teaches acceptance. And acceptance means, I believe I have the truth. You believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. And to my mind, that was the single most profound way of actually incorporating and embracing the kind of acceptance of difference that makes it possible for Indians and for Hindus in general at least in the past, to live peacefully and with mutual respect with people of other faiths and religions. Sadly, that is what is being challenged today. I have no quarrel with the development and economic arguments the minister made. Those are all very well. I think that we want to see our country growing in terms of both the hardware of development and the software of it. The hardware being, of course, the infrastructure, the roads, the ports, the highways, all of which we all welcome, everyone uses them irrespective of their identity. But also the software of development, which is the human capital that is so precious in transforming any country. And that software of development includes, of course, the right for every human being in our country to be able to have two or three square meals a day, to have a roof over their head against the sun and the rain, to be able to get a decent job that enables them to support their families with self-respect, to have a healthcare clinic within at least a five kilometer walk of their places of residence, and to be able to educate their children and dream of a better life for their children than they themselves have. Let's face it, whatever our government says, there are still a couple of hundred million Indians at the very least, maybe more, 
who cannot take any of those things for granted. And that's why that challenge still remains of fulfilling that idea of India. An Indian idea in which I hope we will be able to deliver all of those things. An India in which we will not tear each other apart over unfortunate regurgitations of badly understood history to beat today's people over the heads with the sins of their supposed forebears five or six centuries ago. An India in which we will, in fact, not have a government telling us what to eat, who to sleep with, who to love, what to think, what to say, but a system in which all Indians, going back to that precious constitution our founders gave us, that all Indians will be able to think, live, breathe, worship, eat, thrive freely, unafraid of the prowess of the products of the outside world, unafraid of the religious biases of their neighbors, but willing to take the world as it comes, to accept the differences they see around them, to embrace them as part of the glorious tapestry that makes up the idea of India. That is an India that will truly shine, and it will shine for all. Thank you very much, and Jay. Thank you, Dr. Tharoor. Um, so I, I reckon we can safely say you and Ms. Irani don't concur on the idea of India. Well, I think it's fairly clear from what I've said and what she said. All right. Okay. So um, you spoke of in your speech that um, every person across India uh, has an equal right to the idea of India. But uh, Dr. Tharoor, would you reckon that what has made this India movement right now also somewhere down the line, and we can't be in denial of it, is the alienation of possibly the majority community that we see now the assertion of this naked, raw, belligerent Hindutva? You know, the fact is that politicians, I'm afraid, have to bear an awful lot of responsibility for much of what communities are told they ought to feel. If Hindus are repeatedly told that a particular minority is pampered and spoiled and appeased and all such language, it flies in the face of the basic facts that show that that community is disproportionately poor, disproportionately undereducated, underrepresented in the armed forces, the civil services, and the elite professions, and overrepresented in the prisons. Now, is that a, a community that has been pampered by us for 75 years? I think we've got to be objective, look at the facts, and say, we all have challenges. There are peculiar reasons why that community is behind. But instead of blaming them, particularly for the sins of ancestors long dead and buried, it's, it's a way of dividing a country that needs unity. And unity does not mean uniformity, as some people in the ruling establishment seem to think. Dr. Tharoor, do you really see it being limited to just politicians? Because uh, um, the sheer fact that we are talking about uh, the emergence of uh, uh, what you call toxic Hindutva, for a lot it's not toxic Hindutva. It's a long time in the coming. You, you don't see it like that? It can't be a creation of just the politicians. Look, human beings are certainly sort of seducible by the argument that they are better than others. They're seducible by the proposition that they can hold their head up high and be much, there's much to be proud of. The irony, and I've written about this extensively in my books, Why I'm a Hindu and the Hindu Way, is that I see a lot to be proud of in being a Hindu, but I don't see my pride as a Hindu coming at the expense of any other community. It's not a question of my being better than someone else. It's my being descended from a faith that has a lot that I can cherish and from ancestors who've achieved a great deal that perhaps we haven't done enough to acknowledge during the colonial period. So let's revive all of that. Let's celebrate it. Why must it be at the expense of another community or communities? That's where I part company with the Hindutva movement. See, when Vivekananda talked about Hindus in India arise, awake, he wanted them to awake to their own great possibilities anchored in the sense of inclusion rather than the kind of exclusionary interpretation that the Hindutva movement has brought to our country. But Dr. Tharoor, that's your idea of India. And uh, 
quite a few would suggest that don't be patronizing to somebody else's idea of India. And for them, they do feel that they've been possibly alienated. And for them, they need to assert themselves, even if it comes through religion. Look, in any democracy, everyone is entitled to their own ideas. Uh, certainly, I'm entitled to mine. They're entitled to theirs. As long as they have power, they'll think that theirs is the one that must prevail. But you know, the tables can always be turned. That's what the ballot box is for. But equally, let me say very clearly that whatever their ideas of India, mine is anchored very firmly in the Constitution. There's nothing I've said today that departs from what the Constitution prescribes for all of us. Is that true of what they've been saying? That's the question they need to ask themselves. You talk about uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, what would be, you've spoken extensively about that also in your uh, vision document, but what would be your critique of it if you had to make one? What would be? Your critique of it, if you had to make No, I'm actually a big fan of him because I've written a book about him very recently, and his ideas and speeches and writings are very much fresh in my mind. Uh, I'm afraid that one of his biggest objections was to the idea of Hindu Raj, which is why there's a delicious irony to Ambedkar being extolled by the Hindutva movement, because he was quite savage in his critique of the idea of majoritarian rule, particularly one based on religious community identities. I have to tell you that very simply, he believed very passionately in the principles that were espoused in the Constitution. He made a couple of remarkable speeches when the document was finally to be passed by the Constituent Assembly, uh, which uh, really have stood the, text, the test of time. I've quoted them extensively in my short book on Ambedkar, so I hope some of you will go to it and, and read. Um, but at bottom, as he said, in any case, there are problems in our society. He said, we've created a society with uh, one person, one vote. But, I mean, a, a constitution with one person, one vote. But we have a society where one person doesn't have the same value as another person. We're one man, one vote, but not one man, one value. And he said, we have essentially put our liberal democracy or as a top soil, as a dressing, onto a soil that is fundamentally undemocratic and illiberal. Strong language. But he wanted us to transform ourselves and our society. I think he would, for example, have been pleased to see someone like a Dalit woman becoming a chief minister. But at the same time, he would have wanted to see much more profound changes right across the way in which our system works. And to my mind, ours is still a work in progress. It's still unfinished. The challenges still remain. But we've done a lot of good things until, unfortunately, a change has come about in the way in which we are perceiving ourselves in our society, which I think has diminished us in many ways, not only in terms of our politics, but in the eyes of the world. That was unfortunate. Dr. Through last two questions. I know even you need to head back to Parliament. Yes, uh, I'm already just, late. Yeah, so whatever two, has two happened last questions, uh, in the last 15 minutes, I've missed. Hmm. Right. So um, what's created this India moment is also because the old India continues to argue with the new India. And I want you to maybe draw a parallel with what we see in the narrative, be it Gandhi or Nehru. No, in fact, you know, no one agrees. I mean, no one can disagree with the idea that we need a new India. We have to constantly be reinventing ourselves. That's what any evolving society or polity needs. The, the, the tendency I deplore is to sort of contrast it as if it's Bharat fighting India, that we are all these deracinated elite cosmopolitans describing our far-flung ideas in English, while they, the authentic sort of rooted Bharatvasis, are fighting for a more uh, uh, anchored, India. I think that it's a disservice uh, to the essential decency and tolerance that most Indians practice in the villages in their daily lives. And I'm a person who has spent uh, a, a month to six weeks every year in my childhood in a, in a village, including for many of those years without electricity or, or piped water. I've seen village life, and I think most people very decently live with each other. They accept the differences we have with each other. What Vivekanand was talking about is genuinely the normal Indian way. We have stoked a sense of difference. We have made people feel resentful. We have blamed, we've made it easy for people who have not done well in life to blame others for their misfortunes rather than themselves. And that is where I, I do blame our politicians for stirring up such negative sentiments. I would have preferred, as Gandhiji and Nehruji and others did, a much more positive, uh, inclusive, and forward-looking kind of thought that kept saying, we can do better, we can make ourselves better, we can hold up higher ideals to ourselves. I'm going to ask you a final news question. So, Dr. Tharoor, we are going to Parliament. So, is Rahul Gandhi going to apologize this I don't afternoon? think he's, he's got anything to apologize for. I mean, that's the amazing thing that, about them. The BJP is brilliant, I must say, at politics. And one of the things they've done is they have blamed him for something he hasn't said, 
and then managed to stick that charge on his neck and demand that he apologize for something he hasn't said. At no point has he ever called foreign countries to intervene in our democracy. There is not one sentence, in fact, the Indian Express, I think, ran extensive excerpts from all his four appearances in the UK to actually quote what he said. What he said was explicit. He said, this is our problem. It's an Indian problem. Indians will solve it. But you should be aware because Indian democracy is a global public good. Now, I see nothing there to apologize for. Now, if they want him to apologize for the fact of talking about Indian domestic politics in a foreign country, then the first person to apologize will have to be Prime Minister Modi, who on many foreign visits said that India has been uh, a country where nothing happened for 65 years, where uh, it was, uh, Indians used to feel ashamed to hold their, to, to blow, have their, have their, you know, to, to show their faces abroad. Now they can hold their heads with pride for the first time since Mr. Modi became Prime Minister. I think when he apologizes for statements like that, then all of us can apologize for saying the opposite abroad. I think this is a level of political discourse that we ought to grow up. And but, you know, up. Dr. Tharoor, I, I wouldn't be doing due diligence to being a journalist because I'll correct you there. Um, it's Rahul Gandhi, what you quoted right now, he said it later. The first time around when his first, uh, you know, I would reckon the lecture in Cambridge, he did say that he feels sad that uh, uh, democracies like uh, Europe uh, and, the, and, and America be are actually are silent on what's going on in India. He did say it, and then came the rebuttal. I, I don't recall that. I seem <laughs> to remember him saying you should be aware because this is a global public good. And indeed, uh, asking people to be concerned about your well-being is uh, perhaps arguably something that... Uh, uh, may be sort of teetering on some sort of board, but the notion that he actually asked for any intervention from outside, to my mind, is, is not borne out by any of the evidence that I have read and seen. Could have been avoided, no? Well, I'm not the one who spoke. I mean, all I can tell you is that, to my mind, there is nothing there to apologize for because there is nothing there that is in any way remotely anti-national. Now, you can say... Why do you go there at all? Why do you say any of this? Why can't you talk about something else? Talk about British colonialism, I've done that. Right. I mean, the fact is that <coughs> everyone in a democracy is entitled to express their views in what they consider the appropriate forums. And I, um, I will not decry any individuals. But more important is, is this genuinely the most important issue confronting parliament, that we have to paralyze parliament for a week? Or can we not have... Can we not move on beyond all this tutu meme and focus on the real problems of the nation? That's where I stand. Away from the tutu meme. Thank Thanks you, Dr. Tharoor, for joining us. Appreciate it.